there's an opportunity gap that exists in urban education. And for those watching the program right now who live in Monroe County but outside the city of Rochester, this gap matters to you too. How? The fate of our suburbs is deeply connected to the livelihood of our cities, including our public schools. But closing that opportunity gap can happen. And according to my guest today, it can happen through equity. Here to explain how is a familiar face. Sean Nelms, an associate professor at the University of Rochester and superintendent of East High School, and a special guest invited to Rochester by the U of R, Pedro Nogueira. Pedro is a renowned expert on public education in America, a sociologist, and a distinguished professor of education at UCLA. Welcome, it is great to have you here. Thank great you. Great to be here, Helene. So to begin, Pedro, briefly <laughs> explain this opportunity gap in education and how it relates to equity. Sure, uh, so we, as many people know, we've been focused as a nation on the achievement gap yeah. for many years now. Um, and those are the very pronounced and predictable disparities in achievement that tend to correspond to race and, and class. What we haven't focused on are the opportunity gaps that also correspond to the achievement gaps. Um, and when you think about it, it's almost obvious. That is that the same kids that are underperforming academically yeah. have basic needs that aren't being met. They are, um, don't have adequate health care, they don't have adequate nutrition, but on top of that, they often go to schools that are under-resourced. They don't have access to lab equipment, they don't have access to the courses they need, or in some cases, even teachers who are qualified to teach those courses. If you don't close those opportunity gaps, there's no way you're gonna see a reduction in the disparities in outcomes. And so what we've been trying to draw attention to is that doing more work on the opportunity disparities will help us in the long run to create schools that are more equitable and that produce better outcomes for all kinds of kids. So when we talk about equity, Sean, what does that mean exactly for people unfamiliar with that term in relation to education? What does it mean? Absolutely. I think it's about creating an opportunity for all students have access um, to different resources in the community, if it's resources that are through teaching actual people, human resources, or, or material goods. I'll give an example. My first uh, year at East, I met with all of our teachers and to to understand what their true needs were for curriculum and instruction and opportunities. And I was speaking to our digital photography teacher who said, uh, I have a request. And I said, uh, what, would you, what do you need to make this class a success? We need cameras. And so there's a great divide when you have courses in schools that have uh, required uh, materials and resources like a camera and digital photography and they're not available. When I worked in two suburban schools, digital photography class not only had cameras, they had a green screen, they had digital labs, um, and so they took Photography not as a, 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 the physical point of taking pictures, but how do you use that to become a graphic designer, and an artist, and a food magazine critic? And so our opportunities um, in the city schools often lack because we don't make those opportunities uh, a priority. So equity is about using school resources to create a, a, a playing field that allows our students to compete uh, nationally and globally. Well, Pedro, you are the keynote speaker for an event hosted by the Center for Urban Education at the University of Rochester's Warner School. Rochester is not new territory for you. You are very well aware of the challenges that exist within our city schools. That being said, when you look at Rochester, what do you see when it comes to our educational landscape? So Rochester is also typical of many cities, large and small, across America, because the problems are very common. Uh, and they're related to uh, concentrated poverty. And, and the fact that across America we've isolated the poor and we have expected schools to solve problems that are not simply educational, right? Kids who don't, are hungry don't do as well as kids who are full, right? right. Um, and we ignore the fact that we have basic needs in children that haven't been addressed. So part of this equity agenda that, that Sean's spoken to is about taking a more integrated and a more holistic view of our schools and of our kids and what they need to be successful. Equity always has to be focused on outcomes. We can never take the position that because kids are poor, they can't learn, they can't achieve. That's, that, that to me would be going in the, op the wrong direction. But we must ask the question, how do we compensate for the effects of poverty? How do we create schools that can serve as a means to break the cycle of poverty? That's the question we haven't answered, asked 
much less answered. And I think once you start to really think about it, you recognize that poverty is not simply an economic condition. Yeah. It's a cultural condition. It's a psychological condition. Part of what we have to change is the mindset in kids to get them to believe and to see that something different is possible for them. But that can't just be reduced to a slogan. It has to also come with a plan for how do I get from where I am to where I want to be. If we want kids to go to college, then we have to make college accessible, and we have to start thinking about college not in 12th grade, but way back in elementary school, which is what middle class families do for their kids. And it's what's happening with this partnership between East High and the University of Rochester for one. So we'll talk about that plan though, right? So like, let's answer that. What types of things need then to be implemented so that those, those resources are capitalized on and we are looking at outcomes? Yeah, so I, I think there are many different levels, layers and levels to this. I think there is a curricular and instructional lens, uh, as I gave an example, in terms of making sure that our priorities are supported by the curriculum that students um, are exposed to. But there's also um, other uh, factors, and there's a lot of work around trauma-informed care. So uh, how do we organize our schools in ways that mitigate some of those unhealthy conditions that kids come to school with by having school-based health clinics and having uh, uh, dental and, and vision care support at the school level? That's not opportunity to create equity um, and access. I think equity and access is, 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 is also important. How do we then structure our day that, uh, in ways that allow teachers and students to actually integrate on a personal level, not just a professional level, so that kids understand how to appropriately interact with adults outside of school. So there are many different levels um, and examples of how you address equity, and schools play a key role to that, but they must identify what those issues are and then make them a priority in their, um, their planning. It has to be structural, it has to be systemic, it can't be something that's done by, um, by the seat of our pants. Well, Pedro, you have said that federal education policies, such as No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top, in addition to the education reform movement, have all failed, and that they are not producing the improvement public schools promised. And you've said that has also contributed to the educational crisis facing black male students in particular. So when we hear about creating this equity, and it sounds right, and, and, and I, I understand where you're coming mm -hmm. from, how does that work, though, and how do we get buy-in from a district like Rochester, which has seen leadership and has also seen reform efforts come and go? Yeah. So it's, it's really got to be a whole shift in the way we think about the work. Um, so I want to really commend the University of Rochester, world-class university, for stepping up and risking its own reputation and committing to this um, this high school and hopefully setting an example not just for Rochester but for the country because uh, how is it possible that we have excellent institutions of higher education mm -hmm. across America and so many mediocre and poor schools yeah. there's something wrong with this whole picture in education in America today and it's because the, the, the connections between higher ed and our K-12 system are so weak so I think part of what we have to shift is move away from this kind of top-down accountability which we've embraced through No Child Behind and Race for the Top where we um, dictate to schools what you must do, but don't provide the support and don't build the capacity to get the work done. If Rochester and the university can demonstrate through a capacity building approach that it's possible to shift outcomes and sustain those, that will be truly a breakthrough that could not only influence the way we approach education reform elsewhere, but also hopefully at some point change the way we've approached policy at the state and the federal level. So when you mentioned the example of the University of Rochester, mm -hmm. are there any other examples of cities, right, around the country? And I know you mentioned that there are comparable cities to Rochester all over, but that they have done this. So we, we've seen changes within the city, whether it's uh, with, with crime rates and poverty levels, but also we've seen changes within the education system. Uh, again, I'm talking about cities mm -hmm. kind of same scale as Rochester, and these things are working that we can learn from. Mm -hmm. We've got this great example with U of R and East. Are there others that we can look to? Well, I'll tell you that this is uh, one of the reasons that Pedro is here is he's, he was brought here by the Center for Urban Education Success, or CUSE. It is a new um, branch of the Warner School of Education. And their sole purpose is actually to do just that, is to study um, the issues that impede success in urban schools, to create consortiums with other universities and partners throughout the nation so we can learn from them, they can learn from us. And so this is um, the beginning part of that. And so the Center for Urban Education Success is, is, is we're looking for the best and brightest to come in and educate us as a university, but also educate our community. You ask the question, where do you begin? And how do you avoid um, uh, issues as, as because of the constant turnover in the city or turnover in superintendents? 
it has to start by identifying the root causes and the issues that this, that this community demands. Our community has clearly articulated what they want from our school system. They want to have safe environments. They want to have curriculum that prepares our, our, our students for um, college and career. They want to have administration that is re responsive. And we also want to have a community-wide approach to this problem. If they've identified that over the last 20 or 30 years, this is what Rochester wants, then our policies and our practices and our beliefs must be aligned to that. And so our responsibility as educators is not to come in and create new agendas for the community. I think the, the shift is how do we respond to what the community has been begging for for so many years. And the EPO plan was created based on the feedback from our students, our teachers, and our community and as they identify the critical needs at East. And I think that's why we've seen such progress so far is because we're being responsive. We're not dictating what should happen. We are creating a, a plan of attack based on those identified needs that had a strong voice and strong input from the community. Well, unfortunately, our viewers will, will see this tonight uh, at 8 o'clock, and this will be after uh, your presentation today uh, you know, at, at East High School with the University of Rochester. But Pedro, what is part of that message that you think is important to drive home to viewers that you'll share tonight, you'll, you'll share while you're here in Rochester, uh, to, to further make this point about what this means to create excellent schools through equity. So part of what I want to do is share good news, and that is that it's being done. There are places where it's happening. You can go to Worcester, Massachusetts and find Worcester Tech, which serves inner city kids, and it's, it's one of the best high schools in the state. Or go to Brockton High School, the largest high school in the state, that is a, also a level one school, despite the fact that Brockton is still a poor community. So there are examples like that throughout the country that we need to learn from, and that I think could serve as a model for Rochester as well. Very good. Well, Pedro Nogueira and Sean Nelms, I appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you for joining me. To hear more, be sure to turn in, tune in to the podcast from today's live broadcast of Connections with Evan Dawson. You can check out the hour-long interview with Pedro Nogueira and Sean Nelms. That's at WXXINews.org. Just click on the Connections link.